Uh, today's case, uh, Selco Siwa, uh, is uh, a wonderful transition uh, to uh, Collier's bottom billion. And a, I'm going to start with some frameworks. And I'm going to do these briefly. I'll post them this evening so you can look back at them. I want to introduce, these are very standard MBA-ish uh, shorthand frameworks for thinking about cases. And you heard, I think, most of this, but I, I, I should rub it in a bit. Uh, one is called SWOT, S-W-O-T. And this one has really no analytic content to it. It's just a... Uh, way of organizing uh, your thoughts on a topic, uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. Uh, in the temporal dimension, typically the strengths and weaknesses are things which are immediately present in your situation. And the opportunities and threats are things you might uh, have happened to you or might cause, uh, cause uh, to occur. And um, a lot of back of the envelope thinking about business cases is organized in uh, this shorthand. Uh, so you might make yourself a grid like this and let the column headings be SWAT. And then uh, let the row headings be whatever you choose. Uh, but one candidate uh, is the Porter Forces. Uh, which we've seen before. Uh, how fierce is the direct competition in your business from other people doing more or less exactly what you do and trying to do it better than you? Uh, what's the threat that others not now doing it will enter the business and increase competition? Uh, how likely is it that people will find substitutes for your whole industry? That uh, your industry will be undermined by an adjacent industry. My, is that? A, it, I could. I, I was able to determine which letter it was. Can you hold hold that up and tell us what it's about? Yeah. Um, really quickly, it's hold it up so the video guy can see it. <laughs> as a result of the mineral conflict, uh, such as copper and coltan, uh, which are frequently found in our own devices, such as iPods, cell phones, and cameras. So just trying to draw attention to the crisis. Terrific. Um, it's certainly an eye-catching uh, accessory as you walk in. Um, threat of substitution, then the power of your suppliers. Uh, in the Selco case, think about where you're buying uh, the basic components of these uh, generation and lighting systems. Uh, if, if there's only a limited number of sources, or perhaps even just one source, uh, then they're in a position to squeeze you on price, and that's an important strategic consideration. And buyers, if buyers have a lot of leverage, or, as in the Selco case, not a lot of money, then buyers become a central point of strategic focus. So you could, if you wanted, and I often do this, you could combine SWAT across the top with supply, with, with uh, Porter in the rows, so that um, if you take uh, potential entrance, threat of entry, uh, your strength might be that there's no money to be made in this field, so not many people are going to want to do it. Uh, or it might be that there are huge switching costs, so that once people have bought your equipment, it is very difficult for them to switch to other people's equipment. Uh, the weakness might be that you're making money. And that the Financial Times just ran a large article about how lucrative your business is which is likely to attract the attention of others. Uh, opportunities. Uh, perhaps, um, well, how is, 
how is barriers to entry an opportunity? Uh, perhaps you can build pricing advantages if you increase the scale of your operation, uh, your unit costs may get low enough that whenever a new entrant comes, you can crush him with low prices. Um, uh, and threat, similarly, somebody else may jump in and get to higher scale of production, much lower unit costs, and crush you. So you can, you can walk all the way through uh, the 20 cells there. Uh, but it, 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 frameworks like this are meant to be useful. And when they're useful, they, they're, you use them. And, and if there's a particular cell here that doesn't make any sense, you just put an X through it and go on. Uh, another concept that we've used briefly, and it, and it gets to be important in cases like Celco, is vertical integration, which I've drawn horizontally, as almost everyone else does. And the rough idea here is that on the left is the supply of raw materials, uh, and then, a set, a, con, then making of the product, its assembly, its distribution and sale all the way out here. The sale end is called the forward part of integration, so forward integration. The raw materials and intermediate products is called backward integration. And so defying all logic, backward plus forward makes vertical. Don't ask me how that came about. Um, behind that process, which we think of in very physical terms, is uh, an intellectual and managerial layer which starts not with raw materials but with a business plan uh, and a product design and the assembly of a management team and the creation of channels for distributing the product. Again, left to right, and if you think about the Selco case, uh, where's, the, where's their main focus on this arrow at Selco? What are they mostly paying attention to? Back left. You got to shout if you don't have a mic. Uh, they focus, uh, they, the mo most of their staff is focused on distribution and sales within India. Okay. This, uh, absolutely. So the forward integration of Selco is its most obvious, uh, obviously unusual feature. They're reaching into very difficult markets to do the sales and very awkward places to do the service, which has to go with the sales. And if you look now at another way of looking at the backward to forward uh, story, it's, I, I've reproduced what was already there, but then I've added service out here. It turns out that taking responsibility for durable goods that you sell, right, there's not much long-term responsibility for toothbrushes or toothpicks, uh, but there is a lot of service responsibility for any form of machinery especially when people are going to organize their lives around the machinery. Uh, the classic insight on uh, uh, classic example on this is uh, a McCormick uh, uh, farm machinery in the 1800s. The brilliant thing they did, which none of their competitors did, was to manufacture uh, only during the winter season and use the same people that were running the manufacturing plant to be servicing agents for the farmers during the growing season. So that the advantage of buying their stuff uh, had everything to do with service. Now, think about the laptop in front of you. Take yours. Uh, is service an issue? Well, does it just run, run forever and keep you happy? OK, and what do you do? Okay, or you call them up and talk to, talk to a so-called genius. <laughs> what a thought, right? The genius bar. And uh, max competitive advantage, it's partly the elegance of the, of the equipment. 
but a lot of it is that their servicing is way better than anybody else's. Uh, who's got a, a kind of computer that service is hard to find for? You're all perfectly happy with the support you get for your computers? Well, that's wonderful. It's, <laughs> it's improbable, but wonderful. Um, okay. So you get, uh, with Selco, a huge emphasis on the service end of the business. Okay, now let's turn to the case itself. There's an A part and a B part. Um, the B part is really kind of uh, more like a teaching note than an actual case. And the focus is on a, rural, a, a certain rural part of India and on uh, sales to people who are either uh, in business on, on a very small scale, entrepreneurs of some kind, uh, or householders in an area that is off the electric grid. And it's an interesting fact about India that the electric grid is highly problematic and incomplete. And the first uh, mass development of wind turbines was actually begun in India by a textiles manufacturer <laughs> who uh, got tired of all the downtime in his reliance on grid electric power and started developing turbines for his own use and then had the, had the insight that turbines were a more profitable business than textiles for him and switched altogether. It's now uh, headquartered in Denmark and it's a huge company. Um, so the alternatives to what these guys are doing, the ones mentioned in the case, are the grid, Pico Hydro, and it's very hard for me to envision how you do distributed generation with water. I get, well, anybody got a thought about this? You live next to a running stream and you build a little water wheel? It, it's got to be something a little glitzier than that. Uh, and wind turbine on a micro scale. Now, um, what are the inherent disadvantages of the distributed generation strategy that Selco is engaged in? If you were looking at it from a business point of view, what would be factors that would, would strike you as um, Scary. Uh, yes. Every time they entered a new market, they had to convince a financial institution to finance their products to the market that they were catering to. So it was almost a barrier of entry for them because the kind of people they wanted to sell their products to did not have the resources. And it was also a new concept that they were introducing because financing was never done with respect to energy before in the country. Okay, so one, one problem that is inherent in the market segment they choose to serve is that you've got a twin door-to-door uh, -door finance at the micro level with door-to-door -door sale uh, of, the, of the, equip the generating equipment and the lighting equipment. So that's one difficulty. Are there any others? Maybe I'll just let me carry that around. Any others? Yeah. Um, some days there's no sun, and then obviously a solar system isn't going to work. There are, and there are some seasons right. in which that happens repeatedly, though in the part of India they're doing, it's a pretty sunny place. Uh, but, okay, so that's... that's uh, that's a genuine drawback. Other, other thoughts? Oh, there you are. Uh, essentially, they're competing with the government. If the government chose to expand the grid in the region they're doing business, that would put their, that would put their business plan at a decided disadvantage. Okay, so uh, there's a lot said there. All, all in a, a one elegant sentence. 
Uh, and the, uh, the biggest piece of it, as I heard it, was the threat that the grid might expand into a given area. And why would people, once the grid came, switch from Selco's equipment to grid equipment? It, we took your mic. Probably cost. It's more efficient to generate electricity um, in, a, in a power plant than in your own house. Okay. So. And, in, and is there a general concept here? Economies of scale? Economies of scale, right? The whole point of centralized gen generation uh, is huge economies of scale, right? So that uh, if you... If, if, if the grid is run reasonably efficient, efficiently, it will time after time trump distributed generation. And so why would we do this business? What's the point? Is this something that uh, a brilliant young reptile from the Harvard Business School is going to jump into to make his fortune? <coughs> Sasha, what do you think? No. No, and why not? Um, I think there are too many risks. Too many risks? And uh, how big an upside is there? Um, I, I'm not sure how you would quantify the upside, but I'm not convinced that it's huge enough to take advantage okay. of. Okay. Uh, does anybody remember the financing story for this? Where it comes, what, what subsidies are required? Okay, let's watch a little bit of film and get further along with the actual story. We got the sound, the sound cord up here, guys. Yeah, here it is. I had a chance to go to Dominican Republic way back in '91, and there I saw actually l some villagers using solar power and paying for it. That triggered a lot of changes in my own thought process when I came. Is that back. Loud enough in the back. Harish was one of the first to realize that there was potential for selling solar home systems to individual users. At the time, the only lighting systems in rural India were community installations funded by the government. What we did basically was start off the operations and, and see, uh, and saw that, okay, let's, let's tackle the barriers as they come, rather than studying it and then seeing what the solutions were. So we were a three-member team, Harish, uh, one Mr. Pai, and I, and the three of us together were the ones who were the so-called management of the company at that point in time. And between the three of us, we divided the jobs that were there in the organization, with Harish taking care of most of the day-to-day -day running of the organization those days, Mr. Pai taking care of the operational side of it, and me taking care of the marketing. We started basically with $30 in the pocket for three years, and we would buy a full lighting system from a, from a manufacturer and then sell it and whatever money we would get and buy another. Harish slowly realized that the one-size-fits-all four-light system was not always the most appropriate or affordable solution for the rural poor. <laughs> we were actually dumping technology down people's throat. We were not giving them a choice. Say that we have four lights, so you need to take four lights. And four lights for what? See, the corridor light was different to a bathroom light. A bathroom light was very different to a kitchen light. Why do you need 11 watt light in the bathroom? You need light for the sake of having light in the bathroom. So you can come up with a very small light of 1 watt or 2 watts. So we need to give them a choice of people would say, are you in the kitchen and in the dining room at the same time? So we would give you four points with two lights. So when you're done with the cooking, you shift the light to the dining room and it effectively acts like a four light system. 
very typical example being uh, when a farmer came to us and said, we want a, I want a three-light system, and when we designed a three-light system for the farmer, the farmer ran away, he said it's too expensive. But the technician went to his house, went on top of the house, broke a part of it, and put one light. He wanted light in three rooms. He did not need three lights. And suddenly solar became affordable. Because of the different segmentation of people, and especially the poor, there is no standardized income generating activity. A neighbor might be a midwife, this side neighbor might be a street vendor, the other side neighbor would be a potato vendor, and everybody needs very different sorts of energy services. And especially the difference here being that it's between a need and a want. You definitely can standardize a want. You cannot standardize a need. Because once you look at basic needs, and everybody's needs are very, very different. I need two hours of lighting, somebody needs four hours of lighting, somebody needs one hour of lighting for milking the cow. As Selco focused on creating individual solutions, business took off. However, it was not always a smooth ride, since with success came pressure to expand. We got advice from well-known management gurus that the way you guys are doing it is not correct and you need to not own your own centers while you need to create a lot of other dealers. We went to that and created half the company to create those dealer models. What happened with that was completely the mission went for a toss in a sense that dealers started looking at upper middle class and higher middle class. So the poor were anyhow left behind and because of that we nearly got killed because the market was not so maturely developed for the, even for the middle class and upper middle class. The margin levels for what the dealers expected were not as high, so they started tapering down in their business. And we had a lot of inventory that we had bought because of these dealers. We nearly, nearly collapsed. The mission was going for a toss, the company was going for a toss, the, what we had actually started with was going for a toss. We feel that the middle class and above middle class, anybody else will reach them. They have a choice. They have a choice to go after things. But that's no fun. The fun for us is at this segmentation and the fun, frankly speaking, is the barriers that we come across. No amount of Google search can help us solve that. And that is what keeps us frankly glowing. Even if it takes a lot of capital, it takes a lot of investment, a lot of time. That's the mission of the company and that's what we want to achieve. Okay, um, the, uh, if you had to summarize what was just said there in 20 words or less, what would it be? Sasha. I think ultimately they don't want to be a bottom line company that their mission is not purely financial. Okay, and now help people who don't talk bottom line counts to understand what you just said. Um, so sometimes you talk about a double or a triple bottom line and then you have people who are looking at social returns and environmental returns in addition to purely financial returns. Okay, so ter that's terrific. So heretofore we have talked as if companies had one bottom line and their net results were correctly reflected in a profit and loss statement. And what Sasha is suggesting is that a firm like Selco uh, or a bank like Siwa uh, thinks about more than one bottom line. And they want to say that some net losses in the financial bottom line uh, may be balanced and overcompensated by gains in environmental territory or in social services. So this is capitalism hybridized with uh, nonprofit service sector institutions. And Selco and Siwa are neither of them institutions which would have been designed 
if you thought about just one bottom line, right? The merit in them uh, has to be captured in social and to some extent environmental terms. Now, um, what the, what, what's the market's message uh, to Village India about the availability of light and electric current for purposes like running, uh, running small machinery or heating water. What's the market say? Yes. This is a case where there's exactly as economists say an equilibrium outcome. What's, somebody got a hand up over there? Oh, there we are. I mean, for <clears throat> the darkness area, there's simply insufficient demand to justify expanding the infrastructure drastically okay. uh, across much of rural India. All right, so uh, that's good. Adam Smith distinguishes between total demand and what he called effective demand. Total demand is how many people put up, your hand, put up their hands if you say, would you like electricity? Uh, effective demand is people who would do that and back it up with money. And effect, effective demand is very low. Now, not only is it low, but overcoming it with a grid structure uh, is inherently difficult because while there are some customers capable of paying market rate for grid electricity, the vast majority of customers in many of these regions are below that income level and could not afford any of the above. Uh, in addition to that, their poverty is reinforced by the absence of energy supplies. Right? If you don't have the energy supplies to do small-scale production uh, or to illuminate a market uh, during uh, evening hours or any of a hundred other such things, the low level of commerce uh, is kept low by the absence of, uh, of efficient energy supplies. So the justification for an enterprise like this has everything to do with finding a way around the market equilibrium at zero, uh, which prevails in some of these places. Now, there's another feature in the film clip. Uh, what's the attitude toward customers? How does their attitude compare with well, let's establish the, the high end of the scale. How does Yale do at providing a choice of courses for you to take? Ridiculously well, right? A third of Yale courses have fewer than 10 students. Think that over. Imagine that you brought a cost accountant in here to look at Yale College. How, 20% of my brothers and sisters on the faculty would be looking for a job. And the enormous wealth of the institution is what makes this possible. And it's a wonderful thing. Now, if you were, now, now go, go back to, what's your least favorite company that you deal with routinely? Do most of you have an unfavorite company? I see a good nod right back in the sixth row, third seat in. My least favorite company ever is Connecticut Limo. <laughs> okay. Connecticut Limo. What, uh, dare I ask? They don't give customers what they promise. They're always late. They're too expensive. And they're mean. Mean. Okay. Anybody else got an unfavorite over here? McDonald's. Um, what's your grudge against them? Uh, I have many. Uh, first, how they market to children, and uh, 
how unhealthy their food is in general. Okay. Uh, how many of you have eaten at McDonald's sometime in the last two weeks? That's a really interesting datum. We're at about 3%. I'll bet you are the lowest McDonald's demographic in the country. <laughs> um, okay, but your objection to McDonald's isn't, is, is it that they don't offer a wide enough range of, of customizations? Partly. Okay. I mean, if I were them, I'd say to you, come on, what's the beef? We offer you, what is it, 20, sa 20 sandwiches? Five breakfasts? Uh, is it one flavor or more, or two of ice cream? Two. Two of ice cream. It's quite a lot. Your beef is of another nature, isn't it? That they, that they popularize unhealthy food. Okay, so you, uh, and if you were king, uh, would you put them out of business? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I have a good friend and prominent faculty colleague named Kelly Brownell. And Kelly Brownell, visible to all of you, some of you. Brownell is the leading advocate of the fat tax. He himself is a big guy, actually. Uh, but he wants to tax restaurant fat so that there would be an excise tax on the Big Mac of three or four bucks because it is just one huge glob of cholesterol. Um, but we're off topic here. <laughs> uh, the least favorite, my least favorites are several airlines uh, and providers of internet service and providers of uh, television signal. And it's because they're rigid. Their business strategy, strategy involves a rigid interface with customers. And for the Delta shuttle between here and Washington, brutal. Just brutal the way they do it. And that, and there's a reason for that. It's not just because they're bad people. They're not even bad people. It's because there are huge economies in not listening to the details of what people want. Do you want a ticket on the shuttle or do you not want a ticket on the shuttle? It will leave at 8.17. Full stop. End of conversation. And it isn't even actually a conversation. It is an interplay with a website. And the website is often kludgy, uninformative, and so on. But in a cost-benefit ratio from their point of view, it works really well. So when, when you look at Selco, the first, my first impulse would be to say, simplify. Don't customize. Get one product that you can generate at lo much lower cost and stay with it. Uh, remember, remember how in the dialogue in the film clip and in the case, he talks about one size fits all doesn't work. And what he means is that people who can barely afford this equipment are inclined to take it only if you match it very well with their preferences. Now, is that a, is, somebody defend Selco, please. They're highly defendable. I mean, I guess this goes back to the bottom line we talked about and where Selco and CUA, it's not just a for-profit bottom line, they really want to help people and that comes up a lot in the case where in the end they talk that about what the name of the manager of Selco is, that he really wanted to help these people. And unless he tries to at least, uh, to some extent, customize his products, he won't be able to help as many people as he would like to. Okay, that's good. And hand the mic on here. Well, it's, it's, also, it's also sort of about growing the market, right? Because if you provide a, a customized solution to say, um, you know, a, a, a street vendor, and that vendor is able to, you know, light his storefront, make more money, then maybe in the future when he's adding another side to his storefront, he'll come back to you and, you know, buy the full package. Okay, so there is a, there's a sort of multiplier effect when, in the, on the commercial side of this, you customize it correctly. Now, um, 
the major issue in the background here is how, what's the size of this market worldwide? Ballpark. One billion. Somewhere around a billion. So there are a hell of a lot of customers out there. And the and if that's so, scalability, as it's called, becomes uh, a pressing question for a firm like Selco. And scalability would mean that you could drive your costs low enough and uh, develop your distribution system strongly enough that you can reach vastly more. You know, they are, when the case is written, they're still well under 10,000 households. And at well under 10,000 households, this is an experiment, a noble experiment, but merely that. It is a demonstration project. Now, um, a background fact about them, which isn't in the case, is this. I had lunch today with a, a Yale College alum uh, who worked last year for an Indian company that manufactures equipment like this, GWP. And GWP assigned her the task of finding a sales relationship with Selco. So she spent a year working with Selco trying to sell them a high, high quality but completely standardized system that, wa that was designed to achieve scale economies. And her experience was entirely frustrating because Selco ultimately, ultimately wasn't interested in achieving scale. They were interested in serving the immediate customer base in front of them. Okay, what does that mean? I think it means that Selco is a service company uh, and is destined to remain a very small one. Now, in the case, there's in, in the B case, there's some discussion about their uh, not-for-profit financing. Anybody remember the amount of financing they have? Yeah, no reason you should. $462,000, which isn't, an, isn't a monumental sum. Uh, but it's, it's a pretty hefty sum if you're talking about a few thousand customers. And the rhetoric in the B case is, no, no, we're going to get to 300,000 customers, and the unit cost will be a dollar and change per customer served. The subsidy will be that small. Well, I, I actually don't think they're going to get there. I don't think it can be done with this level of customization. Okay, so now the task is each of you is a management consultant now. And you're brought in by the board of the funder for Selco. And you've got to figure out how to take the, take the baby out of the bathwater, get rid of the bathwater, and come up with something scalable. How would you go about that? Anybody got a thought? Would we fire management or not? O over it, uh, yes. Um, first, I would try to get them to stop being dependent on one geographic area. It seems like they really concentrated between Bangalore and I think it was um, Ahmedabad. Yes. Um, and like clearly, there are a lot of poor regions in India, and once they get out of those that specific region, I'm pretty sure they will be forced to look at it a bit differently. Okay, so let me see if I understood that. Uh, do you want them to move into higher income groups? No. Okay. I want them to go to another poor region. Okay, you want them to go to another poor neighborhood and do what? And clearly by seeing that there are, like, 
since there are so many different cultures within India and so many different needs, if they continue this model of customization, they will see they will ultimately fail and they need to start moving into something else. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to pretend to be another person, a person on the board. Luck, we've already figured out these guys are running straight into a dead end. I'm impatient. You're, all you're going to do is demonstrate failure again. Find me a better solution. Now, anybody think, think they've got one? Yes, far back. Uh, yeah, I just figure out um, a couple of Selco's products, a couple of their best products that numerically meet the needs of the most number of people, and then I would expand by pushing those products. And of course, in the process, you'd lose out on customization and individual solutions, but if your goal is to provide illumination to the maximum number of people, just kind of focus on what you're good at and scale Focus that up. on a few products. Sounds like a good idea. Now, what about people who are, remember there's talk in the case about a pyramid, there's even a picture of a pyramid, and we're talking about serving people near the bottom of the pyramid economically. Is there a way that you might think about serving people at the bottom of the pyramid by also serving people uh, a layer or two above them in the pyramid? Yes. If you can charge the people a little bit higher up on the pyramid um, more for the systems, they can subsidize the people. Below. Okay, so if you can take a, take a, you probably have to have the product differentiated a little bit to produce a higher margin product, uh, which is uh, very similar to your, your straight product, and build a distribution channel in, in, so that the same distributors can cover the higher margin product and also the low margin product for the people at the bottom of the pyramid and achieve some scale economies so that you begin to make the pump run on its own. Um, and there, and in the, the video clip we just watched, they talk about how uh, when they let distributors do what they wanted, the distributors ended up drifting into higher income strata, right? And that's not very surprising because the margins can be much higher, right? In the bottom, the bottom channel, unless you get the thing very standardized, uh, the margins have to be negative because people just can't afford it. So high customization at the very bottom looks like a highly problematic uh, strategy inspiring as it may be. Um, is there, are there other lines of production unrelated to electricity that strike you as interestingly analogous to this? For example, uh, let's say the nub of this idea is distributed production. Instead of centralized grid production, we're doing distributed electric produc production of electricity, just as we have distributed computing on all these laptops. Are there other uh, highly distributed strategies that might be of service in bottom billion countries? Okay, um, talk, uh, so say more. Uh, you could distribute uh, mobile phones instead of, you know, building a, a landline. Okay. It, has anybody thought of that yet? Uh, I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> well, big time, right? I mean, and the, the story here is landlines become completely saturate the market and then cell phones are a layer on top of that. Uh, in all the countries we'll be talking about with the bottom billion, uh, cell phones just leap over landlines. Right? And, and are technologically superior to landlines for all, from almost every point of view in a very low income setting. So that's a, that's a good suggestion. Any others occur to anyone? Jennifer. Water purification. Okay, water purification. And the technology there is 
Uh, how do you do it? Well, instead of running pipes to transport clean water to remote places, you could just build their own filters or uh, dig their own wells. Okay, you could build your own filters, dig your own wells, might or might not work, depending on the water table's depth and quality. Um, but yes, it's a, it's a very good point. And right at the end of the semester, we'll see a case in Bolivia, Cochabamba, Bolivia, where um, we try to fix a water supply system using straight capitalist technique and get into a lot of trouble. And we get into a lot of trouble for, for the, basically because the pricing model for the capitalists to make money leads to too high a price for people who are right at the bottom of Bolivia, Bolivia's pyramid, which is not very different from India's pyramid, except it's got a lot less growth in it. Thanks. Uh, that's, anybody else got one? Fighting malaria, for example, you could focus on like big projects to alter the landscape, like draining swamps, versus just giving people like mosquito nets in their own homes. Okay, and the Gateses agree with you, right? Uh, and are throwing billions at it. And uh, in general, there's this whole family of uh, models for multiple bottom line businesses. And some not so, not so multiple bottom lines, some straight out for profit businesses, where having decentralized production, as in Selco's equipment, is a terrifically valuable uh, asset. Now, for Monday, uh, the main metric that is used in the world for progress and what defines the bottom billion as bottom billion is GDP per capita. And in my part of Monday's class, which I'm about to record, I'm going to pick at, I'm going to start with the proposition, maximize GDP per capita and make a country better. And Paul Collier more or less advocates that in the bottom billion. And I'm I'm sympathetic to that view, but I'll set up some critical screens to pass it through and explain those. Uh, and you'll, you'll see that video at the beginning of class on Monday, and then after my little video, there is a TED talk uh, by Paul Collier explaining what he thinks his book has to offer. <laughs>